These questions are designed to unfold and explain your teachings okay. in the context of Ramana Maharshi, whose teachings reflect the ancient Indian wisdom. First question. Ramana proposed the fundamental question, who am I? Who are you? I'm no one. Um, I have to say uh, from the very beginning that I'm not an enlightened person. And as far as the per perception of the open secret is concerned, there is no such thing as an enlightened person. Personal enlightenment is a myth. So, in some way or other, uh, something happened, or apparently happened, whereby uh, this message began to be communicated through this. But there is no one communicating it. It doesn't come out of an understanding. It doesn't come out of anything that happened to Tony Parsons. It just comes out of nothing. As far as I'm concerned, everything that happens comes out of nothing. Everything that's arising is nothing, arising is everything. So there is no who. There is no who to be enlightened. So, in, in a sense, the idea that there is um, a blueprint for enlightenment, as far as this communication is concerned, is, is not the case. There isn't a blueprint. The idea that there's a blueprint for enlightenment establishes in the mind of the seeker the idea that there's a seeker on a certain place on, on the map or the blueprint who has to get to something else called enlightenment that's on another place on the map. Um, this communication doesn't recognize that at all. This communication is saying that that whole idea that there is a separate individual reinforces the sense of separation only. And all attempts that that, that individual makes to find enlightenment also reinforces, simply goes on reinforcing the sense of separation. So who am I? No one. <laughs> And you used several times this word nothing, that everything comes from nothing. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about nothing? Nothing is the, uh, is the source of everything. It is totally unmoving, unrelated, still, silent. Nothingness. It's not comprehensible. And everything that is in this room and everything that happens is nothing, appearing to be something. Right. Could we use a word like consciousness instead no, of nothing? I, I, I was talking to you in the cafe, and I have found that over the years of talking that certain words just are very confusing, and I find consciousness a confusing word. Right. So the word that I can get nearest to is being. Being, right. All there is is being. This right. room is being, this is being, there is only beingness. Right. And what arises in beingness as a part of beingness is uh, the dream of separation, what I call the dream of being a separate individual. Right. Who right. then feels that there's a sense of loss and they have to find why they feel a sense of loss. Right. right. So, um, so what, ha what we see in the world is a manifestation of seeking. Every, everyone in the world that believes they are a separate individual is a seeker. So everybody in, in this apparent world is seeking something or the other. And in the end, of course, they're seeking what some people call enlightenment. Hmm. But and enlightenment, the, in, in the only secret terms, is simply the end of the dream of individuality. Right, right. Um, am I mean, I going on a bit? No, no, no. You, you told me you wouldn't speak very much, so anyway. But well, I so. don't... <laughs> Initially, with that sort of question, who am I, it, right. a whole lot of things come out. 
to describe the communication out of the open secret, and that is the, really in simple terms the message is that there isn't anyone in right. this room. There isn't any individual. Right. There isn't any who. Right, right. There's only being. Right, right. So there's nothing, there's no one here. There right. simply is being. Right. You just said something about seekers, you know, you basically said that almost everybody actually is a seeker, almost everybody is seeking for something, which suggests that they're not content with the bit they've got and they would like to find another bit to make it all a bit better or something like that. Well, that's their idea. That's their idea, yeah? I mean... Most people have this idea. Yes. So people are somehow motivated to look because there's a sense um, that it's not whole and complete, yeah? So, in the context of nothing, could you address that? That so many people feel themselves not complete, yeah? Not satisfied, not content, not peaceful, not feeling love, and therefore they go out to get something. Yeah. In the context of nothing, I think we have to be clear about what I'm, the nature of what I call nothing no thing. It's indescribable. So the words, directly one starts using words to describe the indescribable, they aren't. They can't get anywhere near it. But no thing is the source of everything. And there isn't a no thing and an everything. Everything is no thing appearing to be something. Yeah, that's very clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the seeker, the seeker believes and grows up believing they are something called a me. And they tend to uh, ob obviously see the, the apparent world, the apparent world, as separate from me, this something. So everything else is also seen as another something. What can't be seen by the seeker, because the seeker can only see from the point of view of being a something, what can't be seen is uh, that everything in the world is both nothing and everything. Nothing and everything. When there is no one, when awakening happens, that is seen, but no one sees it. So, so as far as I'm concerned, there is no such thing as personal enlightenment. Enlightenment is simply the end of the person, or what I call liberation, actually. I prefer the word liberation. <laughs> mm. Okay. Many Western seekers are looking for enlightenment as if it is an experience. What is enlightenment? Well, <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't exist. The problem for the seeker is that they think they have to find something else. Right. So they look for states. Um, or they look for states of peace or, or whatever they think enlightenment is. Right. Uh, for most seekers, uh, the, the belief is that the enlightenment is like a spiritual lottery. If they win it, then their whole life will then be free of suffering and their, everything will be wonderful and everybody will love them and all this sort of nonsense. <laughs> That's the mind's idea of what enlightenment is like. Yeah, right. uh, um, but, but for the seeker, there, there is always a seeking. The individual, the separate, all the time there is separation. There cannot be anything other than seeking harmless. Separation from, from harmless creates seeking for harmless. The, uh, you ask me what is enlightenment, it's impossible, it's utterly impossible to describe enlightenment, but it has nothing to do with a person, and it has nothing to do with process. Right. It's not attainable. Right. When it happens, when it apparently happens, only, then it is seen that all there is is beingness, but it isn't seen by anyone. Right. There isn't anyone any longer having personal experiences. There isn't anything, any person there that anything is happening to anymore. And that's another way you could describe this. Uh, there is just what is happening. So the difference between the seeker and liberation is that the seeker believes that everything is happening to them. In liberation, everything is happening. Right. To no one. Right. Right, right. So all there is, you could say, is life. All there is, is being. That's as near as I can get to describing what people call enlightenment. 
I mean, there is a, what you're describing, we could say a myth of enlightenment, yeah? I mean, this myth has been supported, I think, by many famous teachers or prophets in the past, having their story told, and their story always seems to include some special moment of, of awakening or enlightenment, sitting under a tree or something. To them. Whether this was what really happened or what their disciples said happened, I don't know but it has created this myth of enlightenment being a sort of special event. Absolutely. And the, it is the mind that wants that to be the case. The mind wants enlightenment to be something that happens to a person. And the whole fundamental misconception of most teachings and contemporary teachings is that there is such a thing as a separate individual with free will and choice who can take action and move along a line towards something. This is the basic misconception that drives most teachings. And of course, it's the basic misconception in the world at large. 99% you know, of, or more of everybody that you would meet on this planet would actually subscribe to that misunderstanding. So, what's fascinating, and, and in a way, it's a sideline, but what's fascinating about this now is that scientists, neuroscientists, especially strangely enough in Germany, are, are coming to the same conclusion. But there is no such thing as free will and choice. There is no such thing as a me. The brain simulates a me at a very early age when it presumes, presumes, big lights, that, that this is separate from the world out there and needs protecting. So mm -hmm. the creation of me is a sort of self-survival structure which comes and goes. Can you, uh, would you like to um, suggest why this might happen because when it's 99% of the people on this planet um, living this myth then somehow it's a bit interesting I think. Why would existence create it like that? Oh, there is no why. There is no why. All the all time there's an individual or a mind there's always a why but in liberation why ceases to arise anymore? Um, in a sense, there is no answer to that question. In, in a way, as far as I'm concerned, there is no answer to any question because there is no answer to life. But all the time there's an individual seeking, there will always be a why. Why has this happened to me? Why, why in a sense, have I lost wholeness? Mm -hmm. you know? And what right. can I do about that? And that's when... It's like being cast out of the Garden of Eden or something. But it's only an illusion. Right. That we are cast out of the, but it's an the, illusion. the Garden of Eden. Right, but it happens to all, almost everybody feels they're cast out. Yeah, right? absolutely. So is, could there be any reason? No, there isn't any reason. No. What's beautiful about this, what's amazing about this, is that it has no meaning. This whole manifestation is totally meaningless. It has, there's no purpose there. That's its beauty. Well, for you it's a beauty, but I could imagine for many people, they spend their whole life trying to find a meaning. I mean, most books on philosophy and maybe many great religions, I mean, it's happened because of a yearning amongst human beings to know the meaning of life. I know that the problem with all of that is based on the initial misconception that there are people in the world and that I'm someone, that there is anyone. And the whole misconception is, look, there is something to find and you can find it. Right. Directly that happens, you're back in the treadmill of seeking. Right. You're right. seeking for that, which is already everything. Right. But you would see that what you're saying is quite controversial because 99, probably 0.999% of the people would perhaps find it difficult to agree with you. Totally. Because well, they wouldn't, find it, no, they wouldn't find it difficult, they would find it impossible. <laughs> From the point of view of the individual, to say that there is no such thing as individuality is impossible to grasp. Right. And right. that is what awakening is. It's absolutely impossible for an individual to grasp this. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and, and to me, I, I have to tell you that when I walk into a room and see an audience, I'm really surprised. I'm surprised that anybody's prepared to come and listen to this talk. Right. Because it's actually about death. It's about the death of the individual. Right, right. And the other awful <coughs> part of this message is, it, is that it's totally without hope for the individual. To come to a meeting right. is about the worst thing an individual can do because it's about the end of individuality. Right, right. So it's like coming to a meeting where your suicide is definitely happening in the future. 
And so for people to even pay money for that, yes. you know. They can't pay money to hear that there's nothing they can do and there isn't anything to do. Right. Um, and that they don't exist either. They still come back. <laughs> Quite a lot of walk out, actually, because we get a lot of people who don't want to hear this message. Yeah. And the other thing about it is that quite a lot of people in the audience still come, but don't hear. Right. Quite a lot of people who come have come for some time, and they can't hear this message. Yeah. And they still ring me up and ask me what they can do about their enlightenment. Right. They still believe that there is someone there that can do something about finding it. It's amazing how clever the mind is. Yeah. Well, the, the, the illusion of the individual is very strongly entrenched, isn't it? And the whole workings of society supports that working. Totally. Totally. So it doesn't surprise me that people could even come for a long time to your meetings yeah. and never see this basic point, because that's what I also experience, you know, that that um, even though maybe every time I would conduct a meeting, I'm saying that, uh, people don't hear that no. because they can't in a way. No, they only want to hear that there's something that they can get and there's something they can do about it. That's what most people come to hear. Yeah. So yeah. But, but what's interesting about it is that there's something in this message that totally resonates. And for some people, they may only come once and it's all over. Right. And for other people, they come a few times and the mind keeps on fighting this. But liberation is happening. And what's also fascinating is that when, after it's happened, there's still someone who comes to hear it because it's so joyful. <laughs> it's such a stunning message. Right, and right. I, I have to say, this message is nothing to do with Tony Carlson. Right. I'm, it's got nothing to do with me or anything that's ha apparently happened to me. Right, right. So you don't. It didn't happen to me. So what what happened to Tony Parsons? So when I was much younger, I was a seeker involved in Christianity and so on. And then I walked across a park. And I'm any old park. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't a special it, sacred oh, no, place. It wasn't, it was <laughs> so walking across a park happened, and I thought I was walking across a park because I believed I was an individual. Right. And then uh, nothing happened. In other words, there was no one. There was simply what you could call oneness, beingness, nothing, and everything. And then I walked out of the other side. Uh, I still as a seeker, so for me, that is what I call an awakening. It's like a glimpse. Right, right, right. And I walked out of the other side and then wanted to own this. But I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to be it. You wanted to get that back because it was really nice. Yeah, right. So for many years after that, I was still a seeker. Yeah. And, uh, and then later on, I started writing The Open Secret. And for some, in some strange way, that was the end of any sense of being an individual. Mm. Mm. But you see, it didn't happen to me. It right. doesn't happen to it. The enlightenment doesn't happen to anyone. Right. Right. It is. It, it just apparently seems to happen. Right. Dropping away of the dream of being an individual. So my next question may fit with what you're saying, because the question is, are there any qualifications for enlightenment? Is spiritual practice necessary? So, I mean, when you were walking across the park, it just happened. But do you think there were some things that you had done in the preceding period which contributed to that happening? Oh, no, absolutely not. And that's the, that's the ignorance, that's the misconception. Many people think that something happens to them because of what happened, or enlightenment or whatever you like to call it happens because of, of them or what they have done or conditions. This is so difficult <laughs> to get across in a way because it's so inconceivable. All there is is being, all there is is oneness. What arises in one is, is the dream that there isn't. And nothing that the dreamer can do will change that, because the dreamer is living in the dream of being separate. So the dreamer is naturally attracted to the idea of going through processes or methods, self-inquiry or meditation, because they believe, or they're taught, that that will bring them to the point of enlightenment. But what it, in fact, does is go on reinforcing the sense of them being separate, a separate seeker who has to find something and make an effort in a linear way 
in a time-orientated way, in a process which takes time and choice, which they don't have, in order to find something. Mm. And this whole process of seeking and making an effort to find something just simply exacerbates the problem it addresses by convincing the individual that they are separate and that they, they need to do something about it. So there is nothing that can be done and there are no conditions for there to be oneness because all there is is oneness. As a part of oneness, as a part of oneness, what arises is a, the dream of separation. And, uh, liberation is simply the liberation from the dream of being a separate individual. Mm. I mean, I can see, for example, from a seeker's point of view, he, if he looks at, you know, all the teachers on offer, he will probably find that most of them have been part of some process or they've done some practices and all the religions suggest, you know, you, Buddhism would suggest 20 years of meditation is necessary, Zen would suggest that. And so, so what, you're, what you're saying um, is, is challenging, yeah, what the seeker can sense he needs to do, yeah, because they, they would somehow be um, a sense that, well, if I take some practice, if I ask myself who I am, mm -hmm. this could um, open things up and then that could invite this happening. Oh, I, I, this is an absolute challenge. This is a revolutionary message which has always been around, always hidden. Yeah. It's always hidden, and it's hidden because it's only findable when there's no one looking for it. Right. It's the open secret, what, what I call it. But, but, but there's no question at all that the majority of uh, interpretations of, our, of the human condition and in relationship to enlightenment are all based absolutely on the complete belief that there is an individual with free will and choice. So they, uh, most teachings start from a misconceived belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, directly they start from that belief, they're just going around in a wheel. Because what hasn't been seen is that there is no individual choice. There's nothing to do and nowhere to go. People say to me, what can I do? It's being done. Are they all walking across it's this park? Done. Is there a Tony Parsons park somewhere no. where they all walk, <laughs> they're all walking across? I because me where the park is, and I've said there's a little man there that has to, he charges you 10 pounds to show you where I walk. No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> basically people sit in their room like this and say, well, what can I do? And, uh, and all that can be said is, look, there isn't anyone. What's being done at the moment, breathing, moving, asking, what can I do, is being done. It's, there's nobody doing it. So why would there be any need to do anything if what is being done is being, doing? It's this whole... Um, contradiction of the idea that there is such a thing as a separate seeker who needs to do something that keeps people in prison. So do you have any advice for those no. people that have come to you and say, what can I do? What no. do you say to them? Nothing. And see that there is nothing to be done and there is no one to do it. But I can't recommend that they do that because then I would be suggesting that there's someone there that can see that there isn't anyone there. So do you think some people would go away from uh, your meetings thinking that actually there's really nothing that can be done and I just get on eating hamburgers and going to, go to the football? But people say that too. Oh, so now what you're saying is there's nothing I can do, so I won't do anything. But I then say to them, but now you're doing, not doing anything. Right. It's a whole, it's totally different. And the great accusations of many teachers about Tony Parsons is that he teaches spiritual laziness. He teaches, he tells people that they can't do anything. But I don't ever, I've never said to anybody, you can't do anything. Mm. Because that would imply that there is definitely an individual who can't do anything. That isn't what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, there is no one. Mm. I mean, you're not the only person that said this, because in the Indian, Indian tradition, I mean, Ramana Mahashi was, was, was pointing to the same thing. And in the moment, Ramesh Balaskar in Bombay, he's pointing also to the same thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe he says it in different ways. Life but scripts and God's will. 
I mean, he talks about there being nobody to do anything. Yeah? Well, you don't do your life. Yeah. But he also says that a sage is someone who accepts the duality of life. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, that is such a confusing message. Mm -hmm. Because everybody then tries to be a sage who accepts the duality of life. Uh -huh. I, you see, as far as I'm concerned, there is no Ramana Maharshi. There is no Balsakar. There is no Tony Parsons. There's no, there's no one. There is no one giving a teaching. There is only communication. And, and as far as the open secret is concerned, if someone is communicate, communicating that there is no one, that there is only oneness, in the meantime, you should do self-inquiry to discover that, then as far as I'm concerned, that is what I call a teaching of becoming. And it keeps people imprisoned in the idea that there's something they can do or need to do in order to discover in life. The way you say to somebody, oh, you need to meditate or, or whatever, or even come to the idea that there is no one, you're suggesting that there is self-volition, and that's ignorance. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, that's a very radical position, yeah? What arises out of the initial misconception that there is such a thing as separation, and there is an individual who's separate, who has choice, what arises out of that are all the fantasies that there is such a thing as time, space, journey, meaning, purpose, karma, reincarnation. All those things simply come out of a dream, a dream, an ignorant dream about, be, uh, about being separate. But it's all, it all only is encompassed in the one thing on earth that is self-conscious, the human being. <laughs> Okay. Um, it's always interesting that um, usually you answer what I'm about to ask you, you know. So um, I have another question here. Ramana said that self-inquiry is the most direct route to realizing the self. And what do you say about self-inquiry? Well, you've indicated that you wouldn't say anything about it. Uh, well, there is no route yeah. to what already is. Yeah. All there is is oneness. So there can't be a route to it. Who, who is it that could be apart from oneness and has to then achieve one? Who is it that can be apart from everything? Who would then have to achieve it? And the other thing about self inquiry is that it requires a choice and an action to take self inquiry regardless of everything else is initially a process. So how is it possible that anyone could choose to do in self-inquiry if there is no one? Apparent choice of doing self-inquiry might arise, but it isn't out of the individual. It's just another thing that appears. Yeah, I mean, there is quite a lot of people who um, spontaneously come to this question, yeah? It, it somehow comes to them. Um, who am I? And this is somehow becomes a question to, to address. Well, they, they think it is. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 As far as I'm concerned, do it, you move in down the rabbit hole of addressing the question of trying to find the answer, you're back into the reinforcement of the idea that you are a seeker and there's somewhere to get to. This is a terrible message. It's, 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 a, it's a very radical message, <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people have a big difficulty with it because yeah. any kind of thought process around this message basically gets self-destructive. Just flat. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting is that you see, basically uh, in these meetings, uh, really all this that we're talking about is not that relevant. It can be, uh, uh, in, a, in a sense, there can be a clearing way of a confusion about the nature of me and enlightenment, there mm. can be a clarity that can arise about this out of these words, but clarity is not liberation. Mm. Clarity is, is a state that can come and go. You can have total clarity about the idea, oh, this is a non-dual world, you know, and then your woman walks out on you, and, you know, you, you could try and hold on to your clarity, oh, well, that's, a non, that's something that's non-dual, but there are all sorts of other things, and the emotions arise, and they blast out 
uh, clear understanding of the situation <laughs> in, a, in a flash. Right, right. So, so what goes on in these meetings is not so much to do with conceptual clarity. Right. It's to do with an energetic shift. It's to do with energy. Basically, the, the energy uh, of, of, of being separate is contraction. So right. the way of the age, there's a contraction of energy into a sense of center. Yeah, I'm me. Oh, now I'm me. Right. I think what you're just saying now is very interesting, yeah? because... So, yeah, basically, you know, the, the, the separate... The apparent separate individual in the dream is in a contracted state. I'm in here, this is my boundary, and everything else is out there and can seem threatening or not. So what happens in these meetings, and, and, and interestingly, directly after them, is that somewhere that contraction meets boundlessness. Now that boundlessness isn't anyone's, it's just boundlessness. The seeker is speaking to itself. The speaker is meeting nothing and, and speaking to nothing. So conceptually there can be a clarity about that. But the most powerful thing in these meetings is the, the, the contracted state that can open out into balances. It's a, 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 an energetic shift. And so, and so this tends to happen in your meetings? That, the, the... Or it can happen. <laughs> and the other thing that happens is a complete contraction. <laughs> right. This guy, what does he say? No. So anything can happen. Right, right, right. I think in, in asking you all these questions, in a way I'm asking the kind of questions that I think most seekers would would ask if they had a chance to meet you. Yeah. So in a way I'm asking on behalf of, of, of the reader of the book, mm -hmm. because even though you put all these things down, actually the way you put them down is very helpful for the person that has these misconceptions, I think. I'm, I mean, let's be clear, I'm not putting anything down. There's nothing under the sun that is right or wrong. Right. Uh, you know, seeking is being seeking. There's nothing, I can, have never told anybody to stop seeking because they couldn't anyway. Right. Just, just as they can't self-inquire. But I'm, there is nothing that's right or wrong. Everything that arises is beingness. Everything that arises is oneness. So self-inquiry is being, self-inquiring about being. <laughs> there is no, no one does it. Right. Right. Being looks all over the place for that which is everything. Mm. In fact, is this the play of life, actually? That's totally. It's the yeah, I mean, great cosmic joke. It's the biggest... Yeah. Because, I mean, in a way, people would probably like to ask you, well, Tony, how do you live your life, you know? I don't. You see? So... You know, people do. So what do you have to focus on? What, what do you do when you're home? Or, yeah. So I have to go and say, no, there isn't anyone. All there is, is what happens. So they might ask you, for example, who's the one who really likes this cafe over the road? No. You see? Yeah, obviously so the, for the individual, they have, to, they have to go on seeing this as a separate individual who likes to be in the cafe. All that happens actually is liking to be in the cafe arises. Right. <laughs> Mowing the lawn arises. Right. Right. Taking my dear old 99-year-old father-in-law to Tesco's arises. Right, right. In a way, this is just very simple, you know. Everybody that's watching this, this video and everything that's happening in this room is only happening. It, it isn't happening to anyone. It's as simple as that. Right, right. In a sense. It's, uh, this message is totally simple and totally obvious. And that's how it remains hidden. Because it's so obvious right. that for the seeking mind it can't be seen. And that's what I love about this label, the open secret. Yeah. You know, it's it's very available and totally secret. but also completely secret because nobody really can see it, no. even though it's completely exposed. No. So directly the seeker tries to seek this. They moved into a, a movement forward to find something, and that's how it remains secret because it already is this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? All right. Well, um, so when Ramana was asked, When will the realization of the self be gained? he replied, When the world which is what is seen, has been removed, there will be realization of the self, which is the seer. 
What is the true understanding of the world? There is no world, but this is all there is. This is oneness or being or no thing arising as this. So there is no London, there's no, where do you live? <laughs> it's alone. Right. There isn't, except in the mind, you know, one, one could have a picture of where you live, but that would be what is happening. What is happening is a picture of where you live, not where you live. Right. So right. this is all there is. There is no world. Right. Right. And this is, this is simply what is apparently happening. Right. So you're apparently driving your car from your house in the country to this and meeting. Ball in apparently Hampstead. <laughs> <certain, certain. laughs> <laughs> and I'm going back to Cologne, seeing this apparent cathedral, which has apparently been standing there for a thousand years. Or... Seeing nothing arising, nothing cathedraling. Right. Right. I, I just want to be clear about one thing that people do get confused about, and that is that the only part of this that's a dream in all of this manifestation is self-consciousness. That's, that's the dream. The dream is only the dream of being separate. Right. All of the fantasies that come out of that. Everything else is simply being. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. There is, there's no such thing as a self-conscious tree. The walls are simply being walling. Right, right. This body is simply being body. When there's nothing, no sense of a me in it, all there is is what's happening. There is just being. Right. Right. And it's totally a love of, it's, it's about this, you know. There isn't anything other than this. Right. So, for example, just to inquire more about Tony, I mean, would that suggest that in your daily life there is a great emptiness inside? There isn't a lot of thinking happening. There is just um, a moment by moment responding to the to the life unfolding, so to speak. There isn't much thought going on. There isn't much planning. You don't have a... Planning happens, um, mm. but it, it happens in this. And there isn't great emptiness. There's, there is only emptiness. Because unless there is only emptiness, there cannot be fullness. So there's an empty fullness. And all, all there is anywhere is an empty fullness. Mm -hmm. But all the time that the, the, there's a sense of being a part of everything, then there's a seeker. Right. Liberation is the end of the idea, I am a part of something and I want to... There is just empty fullness. Because when people now would watch this video, they can see a Tony with twinkling eyes, feels very alive good and looking. good, good looking. <laughs> Sexy. Sexy. Can you want to that in? Yeah. Well, why not? Yeah. 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 But and then, somebody who's very much um, fulfilled in a way and bursting with life and fun and joy, I would say. That's how they see it. Yeah. Someone who is fulfilled. Yeah. But there is only fulfillment. Right. Right. And would you say that for you, um, using the word you in a kind of, you know, um, that somehow when this walk in the park happened, there was a kind of realisation of this joy and fulfilment that wasn't there before you walked through the park. I wouldn't call it a realisation, it was just what we would call a happening. In other words, there was no one, there was just joy, or, but words can't describe, there was just boundlessness. Bounds, warm. And then I came back and was still asleep. Right. They were contracted again. Yeah. 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 And then this contraction opened up again over the next years. No, not really, no. I, it doesn't. There isn't, you can't creep up on oneness. You know, you don't move towards oneness. Either it is or it isn't. It's a sudden, uh, it's, a, it's like a fuse blows, fuse, fuse blows, and all the little lights go out, and all that is left is light. So it's not, a, it's not something that you, you can creep up on or get near to, because you are still there, and the airs have been trying to get near to boundlessness. So suddenly, and this has happened for other people, and it's described in different ways, but I, it has to be said that suddenly, instantly, there's nothing. There's nothing left. Right. So that's, you could say what happened when, I, when this book was being written. 
Mm. You mm. could say it happened. Mm. I have to say that after liberation, it's quite clear that nothing happened. Right. Nothing right. is happening. This is nothing happened. This is nothing happened. Okay. Um, what about vasanas, the tendencies of the mind? So, so after liberation, the, the mind simply merrily goes on doing its thing, tends to slow down, but it still goes on. You know, I, as far as I'm concerned, there is no such thing as a mind. There is only thought, a thought, a thought, a thought. So thinking still apparently continues, which is being arising as thinking. For me, it's the seventh sense, thinking. The seventh sense. It's the seventh. seventh sense. There's the five senses, the sixth sense of feelings, and the seventh sense is thinking. There's nothing wrong with thinking. Right. It's not the enemy of enlightenment. It is simply something that happens within the whole. Right. So after liberation, thinking still happens. It gets a bit bored because there's no one listening. So it quietens down a bit. But you 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 think less. You was, yes. we were. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, I don't think less, but thinking happens, but it's lost its power because there isn't anyone that it can overpower. Right, right. Thinking, you know, prior for the seeker, it very much speaks to the individual, and the individual respects a lot of what it thinks. So you don't have goals in your life, which the mind then tries to pull you towards. For no, example, no, we don't have anything. Right. Right. Liberation is total poverty. It is the poverty of there being no one. Therefore, nothing is any longer owned. Right. right. <laughs> now, some of my questions are a little irrelevant. I know but... they would be. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that's what happens in meetings too. Right. People come with a batch of questions and they right. hear maybe the instructor or something. And, and the question simply collapsed. Right, right. Well, these it turns all the tables over. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you, you see, for, for very, I had a very nice question here. Um, how um, must these vastness be be uh, removed, you know, no. before self-realization can become permanent? Because there is actually quite a strong body of opinion that says, you know, huh? You're telling me. That would say that, you know, the vastness, the structures in the mind, are the things that um, have to be seen and have to, in fact, go before the awakening can really stay and become permanent. I think no. that's a common opinion, I that's think. So it's a common opinion, and a lot of, uh, along with uh, a, a legion of other common opinions, all of which are crap. Right. All of which come out simply out of the mind. And Could you address this particular structure. one? Because and it, I mean, who is it that's going to do that anyway? Mm. This can, you know, your Rabbanah Maharshi, I was reading it through a book the other night, and I came across the quote of his, no, I, I can't, who can say who said anything? But Rabbanah Maharshi, I think, said something like, all there is is this reality, all there is is reality. And it's a mystery to me that anyone thinks that part of that, uh, the, this reality is something that's evil, that has to be cut out and destroyed. It's a mystery. How can it be? How can there be that? Now I don't, you know, I don't know whether he actually said that, but I was quite right. I was rather lucky. Yeah. All there is is being, and if the if the mind or the thinking reacts or works in a certain way, then that is what is happening. And there is no one, no seeker, no one. There is no one who can change that. But when there is no longer anyone then all there is is being. So really, in a sense, this isn't about, you know, this is life, and this is this thing that has to do something about relating to life. This message is not that at all. This is, there is no one. There's only this. All right, all right. So along with that question was a question about stages or levels of enlightenment, yeah? I mean, you mentioned that, um, that you know there was a, a big shift in the park and then there was a contraction and then you say you were writing the book the open secret and something happened during that time apparently, apparently. so would you 
address this question of levels or stages of enlightenment? Well, or or of, of, no. no. As far as I'm concerned, liberation, which is the word I prefer, is right. simply the end of everything. Right. Uh, it's the end of a dream. It's the end of the idea that there's such thing as time, story, separation, uh, and it, all of those things simply collapse instantly, and all that's left is beingness. All that's left is nothing being everything, and I don't quite see how there can be stages of that. Right. I do think the mind loves to con construct complication. It loves complication. Yeah. So the idea that there's 37 levels of enlightenment is, is just such a wonderful fantasy. Right. And it's always somebody that tells you, you know, you know that, that there are even seven levels of enlightenment, and it's always strange that when they tell you that, they're one just above you. Right. <laughs> it's another game. It's another game you know, that the yeah. mind plays. Right. The other is, this is seen or it isn't seen. I mean, even our friend Osho did this. I remember one time there was a lady from Japan visiting him and he sprinkled rose petals on her head and then somehow made a comment along the lines of, I can't exactly remember what he said, but along the lines of, um, well, of course, I'm beyond enlightenment. No, sweet. So, you know, this lady is enlightened, but I'm beyond yeah, enlightenment. Yeah. So that's like a slightly different level. Yeah, of course. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if would say that. <laughs> Maybe. Mm. But again, it's, it's a fairly commonly held myth in spiritual circles that... Um, yeah, that there is a, an, an awakening and then later freedom comes, for example. So that would suggest two stages. And there have been some fairly well-known teachers like Shivananda. Who, I think he has a book, uh, Seven Stages of Enlightenment or something like this. I'm sure he does. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the more... <coughs> this yeah. is the cornerstone that is always rejected. Yeah, yeah. This is the cornerstone of everything. It's always rejected. Because it's always rejected by the individual who can't bear to face up to their own absence. Right, right. So they construct all these wonderful ideas about themselves and where they have to go, what they have to do to reach stage one of a ladder. Right. Up to stage seven. It's a wonderful, it's, the seeker can't bear the idea of their own demise. So right. what you see in the world is a way of avoiding liberation by seeking it. Right. Yeah. The mind can't bear the idea that all there is is this. It's really boring. All there is is this. All there is is sitting on a chair. How boring. I want to find him like, I want to find Right, right, yeah. And uh, this is slightly encouraged by tales of enlightenment because you have your park, somebody else has a tree, mm -hmm. some people have shining lights. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a kind of oh, yes. sense that enlightenment is a kind of special happening. You can never take the carrot away from the seeker because the seeker is always constantly looking for a carrot. The only thing that they would find at meetings of this sort is that, uh, is that the whole idea that there's anything to gain, to get, can die. That whole idea that there's anything to get. Is, is simply not fed here at all. And it sort of withers right. together with the soul. Yeah, yeah, right. But in the end, it's an instant happening. Right, so a slow suicide and then a sudden there can be a sort of slow dropping of the ideas about this, but in the end, it's just bang. Yeah, right, right. With a little bit of a shock and then a big laugh. Yeah, yeah, huge laugh. One because guy I know laughed for three weeks. Right. And what was sweet was, what was lovely was that he wasn't, you know, he, he was quite a serious seeker, but he was actually shopping in Tesco's. Right. And then he went back to his flat, and as he opened the door of his flat, suddenly, bang, he dropped his shopping and roared with laughter for three weeks. Right. <laughs> it was so beautiful because he ran out and said, Tony, it's amazing. I can't describe to you what happened to you because you can't describe it either. Right. All I can tell you is that what I have sought has nothing to do with what's happened. What I was seeking was what I was seeking, but what was here constantly was what I was looking for. 
Well, it's never left. What I was looking for was never left. Right, right. Yes, and that, and somehow that creates a huge laughter yeah, because so for some people they've been sitting with their legs bent, uh, eating tofu for 25 <laughs> years, you know, and then suddenly, you know, something happens. Yes. And it's then... What is this? This is always here. Yeah. This, alive. Right, right. <laughs> it's the perfect love. All right. Uh, <laughs> Brahmana's devotees had tremendous devotion to him and he to Arunachala. Yeah. Please say something about bhakti devotion in the pursuit of awakening. So, I, as far as I can see from talking to people, that people are inclined towards one or the other. There's a devotional you know, impetus in some people, and other people are more uh, interested in sort of in person, detached approach, what they think is, fondly think is an approach. And as far as I, I see, that's sort of to do with female and male energy as well. So what appears out of being is, is those two energies, which are attracted to and repulsed by each other. Uh, that's the, that's also what happens in relationships. You know, there's a sense of the the man being attracted to the fire of the woman, and the fire of the woman being attracted to the ice. And for me, liberation is simply the extinguishing of those two, and there's nothing left. But prior to that, there's a fear of one and an attraction to it. But neither devotional or um, detached or impersonal paths are anything other than a, another form of seeking. Right. And I have to say that uh, for me, um, I know they talk about our natural the mountain and so on. As far as I can say, there is nothing that is sacred. If there's something sacred, there's something that isn't. So when you get to the bottom of the mountain and take a step off the mountain, what is the, that foot standing? It's, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's, there, there is only sacredness. The way you delineate one from the other, then you're back into the dual situation. All right. Yeah, I can understand what you're saying. Yeah, this is, but this many is people sacred. go with a lot of effort to Arunachala yeah. and they go casually to Tesco's. Yeah. Right? And they don't really expect in Tesco's yeah. that it's going to happen. But it does. That's amazing. And it's, I know somebody that happened in Tesco's. Right. And I also know somebody else that was fortunate enough that they'd happened in Waitrose, which is a much better class of people who have the environment. Um, right, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if this is sacred. Right. This is right. Being, coating. Right. How can it be any less sacred than in the... Right, right. Well, I mean, this is a game where it's difficult yeah. because, of course, there are places in the world, not just in India, but in many countries, there are particularly... Um, spots that have become empowered in some way, yeah, the sort of sacred places. There are some in the south of England near where you live, I think, yeah, where okay, but many people come there for yeah. some reason. Because they believe. Yeah. Uh, as far yeah. as I'm concerned, it's another fantasy. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. It's nice that you smile and laugh so much, and that you're such a lovable person. Otherwise, you would have been hung up already. I think. I know. People say to me, "You, you kill me in such a charming way." <laughs> Amsterdam. <laughs> don't kill them, of course. But in Amsterdam, I'm known as the Terminator. Terminator, right? Right, right. But you terminate with love, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with a big chuckle and laugh. <laughs> but what you're saying is totally outrageous. Oh, absolutely outrageous. Yeah. Totally outrageous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not new. It's always been. Mm. It appears essential to meet a guru and stay with that guru. Yeah. Who is the guru? What is the guru's role? and how to recognize a true guru. Mm. So there are no gurus. Right. Uh, there is no role, because if there was a role, it would imply that there is a path. There is no teacher, because if there's a teacher, that would imply there's something to learn. How could I teach anybody to be? How would I teach anyone to be, to breathe, to see, to feel? That's all there is, being. So, 
uh, my sense is that this, this is the hidden message. And somewhere when there's a readiness to hear it, and it's not anybody's readiness, it's just readiness, it will be heard. And it, it's absolutely not necessary for anybody to go and hear it from anyone else. You know, liberation happens at, despite us, not because of us. So liberation happens in a field in Scotland with someone who's never, he can't even spell in Latin, or it may also happen, you know, in this sort of setting. Right. Nevertheless, you know, you were just saying that some of your, uh, the members of your meeting might be coming quite soon. So you have a group of people who regularly come to your meetings, probably every month, and they would probably see you as a guru, even though you they don't well, take yourself as a guru. Most of the people don't, actually. Uh, most of the people who come on a regular basis see what is there, which is no one but a friend. It's about, well, they see friendship rather than any sense of there being a guru. But it is certainly true that apparently people will be coming here today to apparently hear somebody speak some words. But it's only apparent. There isn't anybody coming here, and there won't be anybody standing there doing it. Right. It'll right. just be what has happened. Right, right. And, you know, it's possible, well, it, it certainly seems that liberation happens. But of course, after liberation happens, it will be reported back that, that of course, nothing has happened. Mm. Except the dream of being an individual is no longer there. Right. An illusion has fallen away. Right, right. I mean, the word guru somehow means the one who brings light to the darkness, mm. which is not so bad. I mean, it's no, actually sure. quite a nice function, really. Absolutely, but the mind does construct the thing about the idea. I mean, we sit, the audience is here, I stand there, and immediately the idea is that I'm going to tell them something. Right. You know, that whole setup is that I've got something they don't have. What I actually tell them is that actually I've lost something. Right. All that's happened here is loss. Right. right. Loss, dream, being someone who has to find something. Right. But in the mind, there's an idea that somewhere this thing here can teach this thing here something. Right. Right. No. So would you, could you say that you're encouraging that by no. holding these meetings? No. There is absolutely, there can't be any agenda, obviously. Because then there will be an idea that there is somewhere to get to, and that I could help people to get to somewhere. What I, I was help anybody because there isn't anybody there to help. What I was suggesting was that, that just by holding the meetings, you're perpetuating the idea that you have something that you can um, oh, give to somebody. Absolutely, that's how it appears. And maybe in the full purity of your radical no, uh, transmission. Fine. It's fine. <laughs> and it's not pure. It's, this is what happens. It is no more relevant to anything else that happens sitting in the garden at home for me or anyone else. There is no agenda and there's nothing to say. Right. If there was, then this, what we're talking about here, would be completely con contradicted by the idea that I am someone there that can help somebody else Find something. But when people come and see a table of books... Oh, no, they presume that. Yeah, there's a presumption. There's a table of books, you know, there's a, somebody standing, you know, giving yeah. a talk. No, uh, hold on. As far as the seat is concerned, there's always something to get, and there is somebody that can give them that. Right. And so it's just that when they come here, some of them find that that's not quite how it works. Right, right. But you're absolutely right. The presumption is that I am a teacher or a guru or whatever you like to call it. Teaching right. something, something. Right, right. <laughs> I'm not here. There is no one here. What's going on is destruction. Right. What's going on is... You're terminating their ideas. It is termination, but not me that's doing it. Nothing is speaking to nothing. Nothing is speaking to nothing. And the nothing here believes it's something. So there's something here is saying, but I'm something. Hmm. Nothing is saying, no, there is only nothing. <laughs> and the more you look for that, the more you will feel that you are something. Right. In right. simple terms. Seekers often have curious ideas about the enlightened state. 
Please describe your typical day and how you perceive the world. <laughs> it's so sweet, isn't it? <laughs> if I could tell them what I have for breakfast and where I am, what time I get up, they could all do the same thing. You know? <laughs> it's so. I don't, but, but, but I mean, this is an, an also a very common thing, yeah, that, that one projects onto this person who is standing having meetings that they must be living in a very special way yeah. and very special things are happening to them. Yes. You know? Absolutely not. Yeah. So nothing is happening to this because there is no one. Uh, and if I wanted to describe a typical day, I would say all there is is what happens. Right. And there's no one in there choosing that or deciding this or mm. avoiding that or resisting that. There's, there is no one. All there is is what happens. I have to go on and say that what happens is nothing arising as what happens. <laughs> Nevertheless, again, you know, for any sort of seeker, it's quite confusing to see that many teachers wear special clothes, arrive in special vehicles, but they, they stand on special but podiums. They, but they are, seek, they are still uh, apart. They are still they're, they're teachers of duality, because what they're doing, is, uh, what they are stuck in, is still a personal agenda. There's still an individual in there that's presenting themselves in a certain way and teaching other individuals that there's something that they can find. So as far as I'm concerned, they're just the same as, as a therapist or somebody who, who designs sofas. All they're doing is giving people comfort. But in another way, what they're doing is imprisoning people in the idea that they are seekers, that there's something to find, and these people in the audience can be like me or be like this. This has no... What goes on in 99% of teaching has no relevance to liberation at all because it comes directly out of dualism. Right, right. The, the, you know, it's very interesting that when Krishnamurti died, the big the guy... The, J. Krishnamurti. Yeah. J. Krishnamurti. Um, Osho said, well, it must be a tremendous relief for him because he doesn't have to pretend he's enlightened anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was joking. All right. I think to present, you know, the idea that I am an enlightened master and I can teach, it must be tremendously hard work because somewhere or other you have to present what the mind sees as someone in a state of enlightenment. There is no such thing. Yeah, I mean, one, one could say, looking back over the last 50 years, that those teachers who were better showmen at presenting themselves maybe were more successful in one way. Oh, I think there's an awful lot of successful apparent teachers around yeah. all over the place, but what they do, what happens within that setup has no relevance to liberation. All right. It's just another yeah. thing that's happening. It's being arising as an apparent enlightened master. Mm. I, you know, I know that your book is about uh, the blueprint to enlightenment, talking to different masters. I'm not a master. Right. Obviously, if I was a master, I would be someone who's mastered something. Right. Right. I'm a loser. I'm a total and utter loser. Right. <laughs> With twinkling eyes. <laughs> okay, so um, actually it's the last question. You've given us a profound discourse on awakening and liberation. When you would meet someone with a passion for liberation, what would your short advice be? <laughs> well, there would be no advice. Right. But if you, if you like, uh, uh, I would say to them, until your life is lost, you'll always wonder why. Can you explain that a little? It's what I've been talking about all the time. All, all the time there is a seeker. The seeker is always asking, why isn't there homeless? Basically, that's what they really, I mean, no, it, but that's what they're asking. So the seeker will always wonder why there isn't only homeless. Uh, when the seeker dies, when the seeker loses its life, when the illusion or the dream suddenly ceases to arise, then there is homeless. So, until you've lost your life, your literal life, 
as a separate seeker, as a separate me, as a separate individual, then you'll always be a seeker. Yeah. But there is no advice. I can't tell anybody to do anything, or look at anything, or see anything. There is no one. Is there anything else you would like to add, which uh, I didn't ask you? Is there no, anything else it, that sort of comes sort of and around? flows out and then nothing happens? Mm. No, there's nothing. Uh. Do you think you'll include this in your book? Definitely. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I think Great. it's... <laughs> no, it's only that, you know, it might be a bit contradictory or contrary to what else is in your book, but that's all right. Why not? It's great. No, I think there are other people who are just as radical, actually. I mean, Carl Rentz, for example, I don't know if you've heard of him, but I he's... Didn't know. You know, he's quite radical mm -hmm. also, and... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean... Maybe I'll even change the title by the time I get to the book, you know. Maybe there won't be, because several teachers have told me already, before I start asking the questions, that there is no blueprint, you know. Yeah. There can't be a blueprint. Yeah. And I don't know exactly where that title came from, but at the time I was sort of finding it quite a nice yeah. notion, you know, yeah. different blueprints from different people. But these things do change, don't they? Like, you know, yeah. as you say, you might completely change the con construct or the title. Yeah. You could say... Yeah, it's just, uh, I just find actually for myself personally, I have a great fun going around oh, the world, yeah. meeting interesting yeah. characters and finding out um, yeah. what they really, yeah. what's the main message, you know, in a way. Absolutely. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. in fact, in the end, I can say from our hour or two hours together, it's just really beautiful to have this, what for me is a very intimate meeting with you. Yeah. And this interview form allows that intimacy. Yeah. So it's very beautiful to have this time with you. Mm, thank you. Mm, yeah. mm. That's lovely to meet you. And you, and you, and you, and you. Although there is no one here, of course. No, there's nobody here. <laughs> <laughs> but all these nobodies here are quite a lovely bunch because they, I'm sure, also love to meet you. you know? yeah. So we're very happy to have this time with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Pretty painless, really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the difficulties, of course, is that um, probably we could have finished after 10 minutes. I know. I, I was going to say... And I thought you did very well to allow me to ask my ridiculous questions no, for no. an hour, you know? Yeah, and I mean, there has to be some sort of structure. Yeah. That's good that there's a structure. But yeah. You know, in a way, this whole thing can be over in, in, in five minutes. Yeah. People, you know, in meetings and so on. Yeah. Some people come and within five minutes, it's sort of suddenly everything's over. Because it, obviously there's a resonance and there's a recognition because that's what we are. Yeah. Beings. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very, very simple and clear. Yeah. And absolutely, um, actually, I don't find it very controversial. But of course, in the world, in the large world, it's very controversial and radical what you're saying. Absolutely. Mm. I mean, in a sense, it's amazing to me that, that, that only now is it be beginning to become uh, more universally uh, seen or questioned, but mainly, I suppose, because of, of what science is finding out mm. and about the nature of yeah. or the nature of, of, of the individual, the possibility that there is no such thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of amazing because there was a guy in the last meeting. He obviously completely understood what I was saying. He was very clear. And he said, "But this is this is this message is totally revolutionary. What about the world we live in? You know, what if there is no one making decisions, then what about this world? You know, the thirty mile an hour limit or having war with Iraq?" I said, "I said, but it isn't any different. War with Iraq would still happen, and the thirty mile an hour limit happens." Moral behaviour happens, 
but there's no one that does it. It's just done. You know, the thought, every thought we have arrives in the head, and we, as separate apparent individuals, become conscious of it about a second after it arrives. This is scientific research has found. Therefore, we make a decision about something and think that the thought is our thought. Right. We think it's, I'm thinking this. Whereas in reality, we are being thought. Right. Not by a deity, not by God. By what? By nothing. It's just energy. All of this is energy. Right. Yeah. There's no deity. There's no destiny. There's nothing out there writing a life script. There just is being. So there is an enormous play, really. It's a play. Yes, but it's a meaningless play. Meaningless play. There's no point to life. Going anywhere at all. Yeah. No, life doesn't need a point for life to be life. Right. So the, the point of life is that there is life. There is life. I mean, look at it. Right. Who cares about you know, the idea that it has some meaning? Who cares about meaning? Well, actually, almost everybody cares. Yeah, <laughs> Except you. <laughs> Everybody cares yeah, except you. Does. Well, and a few others, but... No, absolutely. Most I mean, you know, about most me. universities were founded all over the world to try to find out what the meaning of life is, you know? All these stone... They could have given me the money. All those ancient all stone buildings. These big yeah. museums and, and so on. And if they'd asked, given me a ring, I could have, they could have given me the money. And right. So for Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> or 99 rolls <laughs> no, it's, it's stunning. Mm. I think it's amazing. And what do, your, what do your friends down in Devon think about you? Um, Dorset. No, Dorset. Uh, we have some friends who don't, who, who aren't at all interested in this. And so we're just friends at that level. Yeah. And then we have a lot of other friends all over the world, really, who are totally right. fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hate it too. <laughs> mm. Anyway, the way you uh, share the message is very beautiful oh, and sweet. Uh, it's really Thanks, very nice to meet you. And you. Thank you. <laughs>